Good morning, good day, good evening, everyone. Um, a warm welcome to everyone for joining us as part of the, our 10 by 10 series at We Care Solar celebrating a decade of work. In today's fifth webinar as part of this series, we'll, we will be speaking with We Care Solar's international team to hear about their perspectives and opinions on how COVID-19 has changed life in their respective countries. My name is Christina Briglup, and I'm the Senior Director of Global Programs at We Care Solar. I'm delighted to introduce our international programs team in our Light Every Birth countries. Today, we're joined by Dr. Ambrose Kutungi Muwezi, our Africa Regional Director, Feza Green, our Senior Uganda Program Manager. Both Ambrose and Feza are based in Kampala, Uganda, where our uh, regional office is located. Shamiza Moyo, our Zimbabwe Program Manager based in Harare. Fadmata Leg, our Sierra Leone program manager based in Freetown, and Mia Tose Kanjin, our Liberia sustainability consultant in Monrovia. With over 38 million positive cases and 1 million deaths worldwide, the COVID pandemic has gripped the world. Uh, while every country has been in, in impacted, we know full well that not every, everyone is impacted equally. COVID-19 has magnified the deep inequities in society, and has stalled social and economic mobility for many people. Today, we're gonna to hear perspectives from our line of your birth countries of Liberia, Uganda, Zimbabwe, and Sierra Leone. Just for a visual, um, this is a map, so you can just kind of get a sense of where we are. Um, we have a couple countries in West Africa, um, and these are our line of your birth countries, which is really part of an initiative that we are implementing, where we ensure that across the entire country and our target countries, um, every public facility has access to reliable light and electricity. Um, we know very much from our own experiences with COVID-19 that for every country, but then within a country, district, region, state, um, the response has been different. So we wanted to just share some data so you can kind of get a sense for the countries that we're going to hear from. Um, what's their population, the total cases of, of COVID-19 they've had, how many deaths, how many recovered, and then of course the tests done in treatment centers. Um, just as a comparison for those that are based in the United States, that's where We Care Solar's headquarters are based, um, we have 7.9 million positive cases and, and over 216,000 deaths, just as a, a, a comparison point. So in today's discussion, we're gonna hear from our panelists on um, how their governments have responded in each country, um, how the community members have responded to those government guidelines, what is been the kind of major negative and positive impacts of COVID-19, how it's um, specifically impacted maternity care, and then how have we managed to continue with our light of rebirth implementation despite the pandemic. Each of our light of rebirth countries had had varying um, government responses to the prevention and management of COVID-19, but there are some similarities. Ambrose, can you start us off by talking a bit about how our light of rebirth countries have responded to the COVID pandemic? And feel free to highlight anything specific to Uganda. Thank you very much, Christina, and the good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone around the world uh, joining us in the 10 by 10 power of connection. Like Christina has mentioned, COVID-19 has affected different countries differently, and of course, with varying magnitudes of the consequences. But important to note is that COVID-19 has affected all sectors of government, from education, to health, tourism, to the economy, to transport systems, security. And so all these have been affected in different ways. Countries with experiences of previous outbreaks, like Sayon and Liberia and Uganda that were affected by Ebola in the past years have had an experience and setbacks in the health systems. And so these have been affected in a unique way. What I would want to highlight is that these countries have responded in a more systematic way that is closely related, though with the different approaches. And my, the first thing I want to mention is the national guidance of the respective presidents where the national COVID-19 task forces have been set up that have trickled to district task forces and then to community task forces. And the emphasis has been on, on, on arranging coordination, 
a mobilization of resources, implementation, and accountability. And this has been very important to be able to guide the different sectors of government so that the implementation is appropriate. The second thing on the response was limiting travel. And these travel limitations were both in country and out of the countries, where within the countries we limited intercity and interdistrict uh, travels so that you avoid movement of any infected individuals. But we're aware that in Africa and specifically our countries we work in, the cases came in late March and early April. So the airports were closed and other border entry points so that appropriate testing, appropriate isolation of any cases was effected. The third thing is very important was avoiding congregation of people. And this led to closure of schools. Unfortunately, though it was very important, closure of uh, centers of worship, churches, mosques, and other areas. And then also minimizing any social gatherings and limiting number of individuals. These had consequences, of course, on the livelihoods of the people, because these are places of income generation, but they were very important. The other part was instituting of lockdowns. These lockdowns may they will be emphasized later, but we're affecting both public and private transport so that people are able to keep in their homes and only move to get essential commodities like food and drugs and things of the sort. Then this, there was also later uh, included in infection prevention mechanisms. Well aware of the COVID uh, uh, preventive approaches. So in Uganda and in other countries, we emphasize use of face masks, social distancing, hand washing, and of sanitizers. And then the issue that has been very important has been the contextualization and the adaptation of the, the WHO approved and operating procedures and guidelines, the SOPs, so that all institutions are aware of what needs to be in place and how they can prevent COVID-19. With all these in place, we saw challenges at both family level and community level. And so there were a couple of psychosocial mechanisms to support the vulnerable populations, like food distribution, counseling, a supporting delivery of medicines and other commodities to the people so that you're able to address their immediate and long-term needs. And so the other thing which is very critical was the involvement of the private sector in the response. However, these governments could run on their own, so the private sector was involved in both initially and ongoing in production of masks, in mask production of sanitizers approved and tested by the agencies in government so that availability can be emphasized. And this has been very, very important. But we also saw a huge a support of supplies from private sector, like in fundraising drives, a donation of food to the communities that are vulnerable. And these have all been instrumental in ensuring the survival, but also in the response towards COVID-19. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you, Ambrose, for that really um, thorough overview. Um, you know, you mentioned lockdowns. I know that's something that's occurred in all of our line of your birth countries. It might be something unfamiliar to some of our audience members. Feza, in Uganda, there was a lockdown. Can you talk, um, talk to us about the particulars of what that lockdown looked like in Uganda? Thank you, Christina, and greetings to everyone. Um, so in Uganda, effective first April 2020, the country was put under a total lockdown and a curfew running from 7 p.m. to 6.30 a.m. This applied to all persons apart from workers whose work was deemed essential, such as medical personnel, bankers, employees of funeral homes. The lockdown included closure of all institutions of learning, suspension of all social gatherings like religious and cultural meetings, political rallies and weddings. There was also a ban on the use of all personal transportation, both 
public and private transport. Non-food businesses like malls, salons, bars were all closed off. The country's borders were also closed off, including the airport. The borders were only open to transportation of goods. Although our measures were really stringent, the government managed to buy time to prepare its health system and learn more about COVID-19. But the restrictions have relaxed since June 2020. So that's more or less what our lockdown looks like. Thanks, Christina. Thank you, Feza. And we'll, we'll hear later um, how we would manage to actually continue our work um, during these lockdowns. Um, Ambrose mentioned, you know, both Sierra Leone and Liberia have experienced countrywide public health crises during the, the 2015 and 16 Ebola epidemic. So looking to Sierra Leone, Fatmata, can you talk to us about what you think um, the Sierra Leone government learned from the epidemic and how it informed the government's response to COVID-19? Right. Thank you, Christina. Welcome, everyone. Um, for Sierra Leone, I think with the experience of the Civil War and Ebola, not distant memories, um, Sierra Leone was on edge about COVID, and Sierra Leoneans were all worried whether our already weakened health system could face up to this unknown virus that was proven to be difficult to handle for countries that have more mature health systems than ours. You could almost feel the country holding its breath that we remain at zero cases. As you may recall, Sierra Leone was one of the last countries to register a COVID case. So when we did have our first case, some of the steps that the government took, which um, could be attributed to um, lessons from Ebola, were having a contact tracing system in place, um, having an emergency toll-free um, contact number for suspected cases, um, the quick isolation of suspected cases, um, IPC in all, all health facilities, and then at all levels, especially businesses, marketplaces, um, and it was also encouraged for homes as well, um, effective triage in health facilities, social distancing, such as no hand holding, no hand shaking, close body, body contacts and things like that. Um, the EOC, which, is the, which was the emergency operations center, and was the Ebola uh, response task, task force was initiated when we registered our first case and became NACOVERC, which is the COVID response task force. And this has a central station as well as coordinators at all districts in the country. Also some things that were just mentioned um, in Uganda, uh, we had a travel ban enforced. So these are some of the things I think from Ebola time that we we, uh, the government used to try and manage things in Sierra Leone. Mm. Wonderful, thank you. So we have a sense now of how governments have responded in our Light Every Birth countries, both initially and kind of ongoing. But as we know from our own communities, the people in the community might respond differently to the guidelines and precaution government have recommended or enforced. So turning now to Zimbabwe, um, Shimizo, from your perspective, how have the people in, in Zimbabwe responded to the specific guidelines for preventing COVID-19? And have you seen any changes over time? Thank you, Christina. So Zimbabwe was one of the countries that went under total uh, lockdown initially. And you'll find that initially people were more cautious uh, and relaxed uh, as time went on. Uh, more cautious in the sense that um, there was total adherence to lockdown regulations initially. Uh, but as time went on, you'll find that uh, due to livelihood pressures, uh, businesses were starting to sort of open up, more requests were going to government to open up different types of businesses um, as people uh, depend on their businesses as a source of livelihood. So it was really, a, a government was in a catch-22 uh, in terms of wanting to manage uh, the spread of COVID-19, at the same time trying to maintain a delicate balance between people's sources of income. Um, and you'll find that there were also varying perceptions between the urban communities and the rural communities. Um, our installation teams managed to go out into the rural areas to do installations. And uh, they, they came across uh, comments as well as um, perceptions perceptions and attitudes from um, people in the rural areas, uh, implying that uh, they, uh, those coming from the 
big cities are the ones who are li more likely to bring COVID-19 uh, to the rural areas uh, as compared to, um, because the rural areas do, does not have any COVID-19 cases. Uh, so this was just people's perception, thinking that COVID-19 is, 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 is just mainly taking, uh, spreading in the big cities compared to uh, the smaller rural cities. But uh, as, as time would tell, uh, this was not the case when uh, a lot of community uh, cases were then recorded. And um, initially there was also a lot of information circling from all angles. Um, and you know, when a lot of information circles, some of it is true, some of it is, is false. So, but government did very well in uh, creating um, its national task force and through the Minister of Health, they were responsible for sharing uh, daily updates in terms of the COVID-19 situation, what is happening, um, where most of the cases are coming from, be it community spread versus returning residents, uh, which part of the country, as well as even the, the deaths that were occurring, uh, whether they were within the community or at institutions. So as time went on and information was now uh, more readily available, uh, people sort of um, became a bit more at ease in terms of understanding um, everything about COVID-19 because I, I know that initially um, it was a very uh, fearful situation. Thank you. Thank you, Shamiza. I think that resonates well with kind of thinking through also Liberia, turning to Liberia now, kind of at the beginning of the Ebola pandemic, we know there was a lot of mistrust, a lot of misinformation as well. Um, Mitose, can you talk a bit about how you think the Ebola pandemic in Liberia affected the way that people responded to the COVID-19 precautions the government were implementing? Thank you, Kristana. Uh, Ebola, Kim, I first uh, when the Ebola came in Liberia 2014, at the onset there was a uh, political games, which were termed as political games, and also, and no one believed what the government said at that time. So because of that uh, negligence on our part, we found out that uh, Ebola has to infiltrate and uh, caused a lot of damages here. So with the experience from uh, Ebola, uh, when we learned and we were seen on cable news where the COVID was raging held in, uh, in Europe and the States, the government went quickly and set out a, a, a mechanism that uh, will prevent First, the people from entering the country, the airport, they set out a team for testing. In fact, the first time it was testing team that was to the airport. Before you enter, you go through a test. And then from there, we had our first case, the government immediately closed the airport and all borders. And the uh, first case was registered in Maserato. So the two countries are where the happy center was at uh, uh, Mosserado and uh, Magibi initially. So the government has to currently lock down those two countries and nobody was coming into Monrovia for almost three months. But with all these uh, restrictions, with all these guidelines, I think uh, we the citizens we took it seriously because uh, we never wanted to go back to where we came from with Ebola. So every uh, uh, guidelines that the government if we took it seriously, churches closed, uh, uh, mosques closed, all the, 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 the centers, uh, I call it the, the entertainment centers, the bar, all restaurants, everything came to a, a halt. And which we know it was uh, economically, it was affecting us, socially it was affecting us, but we have to take it into consideration because of where we came from with Ebola. So with these guidelines, I think that, Liberians uh, took it seriously, and this is where we are today. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. I'm sure, yeah, there's a lot that I think many countries around the world can learn from Liberia, Sierra Leone, and other countries that have experienced um, countrywide um, epidemics and pandemics. 
So we know very well that the impacts of COVID-19 are immense, they're multi-sectoral, and in many ways devastating across a number of different functions across society. Um, so Fatmata, thinking about Sierra Leone and, and knowing about our other Latin reborn countries, what do you think in your opinion have been some of the greatest negative impacts from COVID-19 that you've seen? Um, thank you, Christina. So stating the obvious, um, the economy has been negatively impacted and this is a global impact um, that we're all facing from this pandemic. Businesses are affected, some have closed or are closing down. Those that remain open are laying off employees reducing the number of staff or a number of days they stay open. Um, the travel ban also restricted what was coming in with a preference put on medical supplies, meaning that those that dealt with other things um, had limited stock. This then drove by, um, driving up the prices of what's available in country for consumers. And this then makes an already tough decision for people even tougher to prioritize things such as food on the table versus going to the hospital for proper care. And because let's say if you're lucky and you still have a job, they now have a limited income, prices have gone up. Some who were getting um, extra financial help from loved ones overseas through remittances can't depend on that anymore because like I stated, this is a global effect and people overseas are also facing the same thing. So directly affecting healthcare, however, we saw decreased uh, we saw decreased service health utilization at the beginning of the pandemic, with people either not able to afford um, to go to the hospital or being scared to go to the hospital, and they would rather go to a pharmacy or pay a health worker or ask a health worker to treat them in their homes. Um, we also saw decreased capacity to manage other illnesses uh, or diseases like malaria and HIV because all efforts uh, were put towards managing and controlling the spread of COVID. Um, Non-urgent health services like ANC and, or immunization and, uh, were put on hold with mothers being scared of going to hospitals of fear of being infected. Um, we are experiencing depleted health budgets due to increased spending on COVID response um, so for supply chain, stock out of health, health supplies like PPEs, surgical gauze, and some family planning essentials. Um, of course, um, for private healthcare, we saw an increase in cost there as well. Um, then also we, um, there was a downing of tools whereby health workers went on strike because of lack of or delay in payment and also inadequate provision of PPEs. So those are some of the negatives that I can think of that definitely impacted Syrian. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I know it's a, a sobering list and it's very evident that there are economic health. We're gonna hear a bit more about the health impacts, supply chain impacts. Um, so thank you for sharing. We also know very well that, that COVID-19 has impacted our social structures, our mental health. Feza, um, can you speak to some of the things that you've seen or you're aware of that's been happening in terms of mental health and social issues in Uganda? Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> so as you've rightly mentioned, uh, it's not just the economy that has been affected in Uganda, but also it has, COVID-19 has also had a social impact. We've seen a surge in social issues like domestic violence amidst the pandemic, mainly because restrictions on movements have left the victims of domestic violence trapped in their homes with their abusers. And they're also unable to seek help the Ministry of Gender actually estimates that there were over 3,000 cases of gender-based violence reported in the first few months of the lockdown. There has also been an uptick in the reports of social abuse, teenage pregnancies, early marriages, and suicide cases compared to last year. So the increase in suicide cases has been attributed to the depression caused by the lockdown. Many have been left jobless, in debt. It's really tough. Um, they're really tough times. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for, for sharing. Um, uh, Fatmata mentioned that there were health workers striking in Sierra Leone. Currently, I think in Liberia, health workers are striking. Uh, Shamizo, health workers also were striking in Zimbabwe prior to COVID-19. Often health workers are striking for a number of reasons. Most often it's related to pay. 
Um, can you talk a bit about how, how has the health workers striking um, been compounded by the COVID-19? How has this made this uh, worse or harder? Thank you, Christina. So yes, indeed, um, the, the health system uh, was already under pressure uh, just before the uh, first COVID-19 uh, cases came out. And uh, this was worsened um, when uh, COVID-19 um, cases started being um, uh, identified and the health workers uh, were demanding for um, COVID-19 allowances. And um, what also made it worse was that um, in the first couple of weeks, there were many health workers that uh, got infected with COVID-19. And um, you'll find that even up to now, uh, the total is like 406 uh, health workers to date that have been affected by COVID-19. So because of this, uh, you'll find that uh, many health workers ended up um, not, not really wanting to, to put themselves in the front line initially. Um, I think also to do with issues of uh, shortages of PPE. Um, but as, as time went on, as uh, trainings took place in terms of management of COVID-19 cases, uh, the, strike, the strike ended and uh, health workers uh, felt more at ease in terms of uh, managing uh, COVID-19 cases. And, and uh, thankfully, we've not had uh, that many uh, number of inpatient um, uh, cases um, in the, in the, to be managed in the ICU. Um, but against this background, you'll find that um, in terms of where the public health system was already under pressure as well, uh, the private health system, to some extent, some, some, some institutions uh, were coming in and um, worsening the situation by requesting uh, huge amounts of uh, uh, monies in, in, in order to admit uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, citing um, possibilities of, 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 of managing an ICU patient. So it's all these uh, different uh, dimensions that really uh, compounded the COVID-19 um, situation on the health system in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's very evident that COVID-19 ending is just exasperated any issue that already were there, and it stretched a lot of health systems pretty thin. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously there are really a lot of negative impacts from COVID-19, and it's, it's hard to kind of imagine or think about, are there any improvements that have resulted from COVID-19? Um, Ambrose, can you, can you talk us through, is there any kind of positives that you've seen, and, and what's your perspective? It's very interesting from everybody mentioning the negative aspects of COVID-19. So the positives become very minimal and thin, but I would want us to be very observant that much as there have been challenges with COVID-19, there were a couple of improvements made in the health sector. And I would, I would specifically say, no doubt Uganda. Before COVID-19, the there were only about 50 to 70 ICU beds, functional ICU beds in Uganda, to a population of uh, 100, no, 400, uh, 40 million people, and with about a parliament of 400 to 500 people, you can imagine. And so COVID-19 pushed the health sector to be able to improve the infrastructure of ICU, well aware of its effects on respect to the system. So as we talk now, we have an average of about 300 ICU beds in Uganda, which of course will go a long way. Even when COVID-19 is gone, there will still be need for ICU beds, for trauma patients, for patients with coma. And so that has been a positive aspect of, of that. But also, we had a, a massive procurement of ambulance vehicles support transfer of patients between different facilities, which, were, which had been a gap before COVID-19. The thing is we got funding from different agencies to recruit additional personnel to support the health sector, which is an improvement in the human resource in norms of the, of the institutions. So those have been very critical. 
but also at community level, we know that hand hygiene and general uh, uh, preventive mechanisms for foodborne diseases. So despite of people knowing that hand washing is important, during the practice, it's been like over 10% of the population, but we see now an improvement in hand hygiene. Even in a shop, a grocery shop, has a hand washing facility at the entrance. A church has one, a school has one, a supermarket has one. So that has improved hand hygiene, and we expect to see a drop, a huge drop in foodborne diseases. The other thing is that we have appreciated that. We can actually operate from home. We can operate from every corner of, of the country and be able to run businesses, run offices, instead of the face-to-face -face meetings that are very costly. So there has been that approach of people understanding that you need to run a full office, but you can actually have people come in and work from home and be able to operate effectively. Of course, it's for every office, but different service providers. And then also, we are coming towards the elections in about three, three months. We'll be electing our, uh, a new term of office for the president and other members of parliament and local councils. And they're conducting campaigns without actually meeting people face to face. So it's another approach to life where you can actually conduct a campaigns on radio, on televisions, or on Facebook live sessions. So which has also been another form of, of change in, in, in a positive way. You realize that there are a few positive things to mention, but I can say that most of them are, are, are long lasting and be able to change the attitude and the, perce and the perception of the people. Thank you so much, Christine. Thank you for that perspective. Um, I know also that some of the positives I've heard from my friends have been around being able to spend more time with family. Um, Mitosi, I know that you spoke a bit about this, how it's impacted families and communities for you personally, but in, in the community that you see, can you speak a bit to what you've seen in terms of that? Yeah. Um, uh, thank you again. Yeah, COVID has affected us culturally. Um, as a family, we, for us, we are African and we are Liberians. We believe in an extended fam family and we believe in a lot of cultural practices. Uh, since uh, COVID came in and with the lockdown, where uh, we were restricted from traveling from one country to another, uh, it has been difficult for every family here, uh, where the, uh, people, for instance, your loved ones will die. You are not able to cross from Maserati to go to Lima, for instance. And uh, sometimes uh, the time we take, for instance, to, to do those burial uh, ceremony, it was cut short. For, during the COVID, someone, your, 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 your family members died, uh, it won't take them two days, they are buried. And sometimes uh, uh, what, what some of the family did was because of the, the financial uh, setback brought in by COVID, uh, they turned those ballots over to uh, the COVID team to be buried. So it affected the flood of us extremely that, uh, in fact, it's still affecting because uh, some, in, like for instance, we have people at the countryside who are find it difficult to travel to Monrovia because uh, the thing that Monrovia is where we have uh, the virus. Uh -huh. So if you leave, for instance, if you leave from Monrovia to go to the country, to our villages, uh, they are afraid of you. So it brought a lot of barriers, it brought a lot of uh, 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 setback in funding year. And this is what we've been experiencing since COVID set in. Thank you. Thank you for, for sharing. And I just want to, we're coming close to the top of the hour, but I'm just encouraging people who are listening. We have, I know, um, people listening from all around the world. Feel free to share in the comment section any, any comments that you have or, or questions you have. We'd love to hear from your voice as well. Um, so we've heard very much how COVID-19 has impacted any sectors. One of them is very close to our heart at We Care Solar, which is healthcare and in particular um, maternity care. Um, Ambrose, 
you know, as the Africa Regional Director, you're working across a number of countries. Can you kind of summarize for us what you think have been the greatest impacts or change on the healthcare service delivery and specifically how it's impacting uh, mothers and newborns? Thank you, Christina, and, and everyone. The effect of COVID-19 on healthcare per se and mothers and newborns has been very unique because these are very vulnerable people. And I would want to classify this challenge in two ways, on the demand supply, and on the demand side and the supply side. So from the demand perspective, this is where you would notice that there was decreased utilization of health services due to people failing to access health facilities, like we've mentioned about when there was lockdown. We know in the different countries we operate in, the availability of ambulance services is very suboptimal. And so when there were lockdowns, it was difficult for the mothers to be able to reach facilities for services. And so other, well, others would be scared of contracting COVID-19 in health facilities. So on the supply side, there were challenges in supplies in terms of medicines uh, and, and other uses and other, uh, and other drugs that need to be used at the facilities because of focusing on, on, on a budget to COVID-19 response. But also health workers were diverted to respond to COVID. And we have noticed that this has improved over time. And now we are seeing more mothers come to health facilities and being able to get services as the lockdown was eased and supplies have been improved. Like I've also mentioned, the referral systems were very challenged because you know, most of the people in our countries use basically the public or private transport to these facilities and these were under lockdown. Three is increment in household expenditure. You might be funny, but imagine having during the day, you have the whole family scattered in the town. So once you have them at home, the cost of running home is very high. And this trickled to the available resources for seeking health services. So the cost of expense at household as for healthcare increased and affected the use of services. And then also, we're aware that in the private sector, the health facilities survive on the premiums they get from the patients. So once the patients were reduced, for them to meet their needs, then they increase the cost of accessing health services. And all these were affecting the, the, the patients themselves. So you notice that these were challenges that we faced initially in the first three, four months of the response. But as we, we've gone into the second and the third phase of the response, these have changed. And we're seeing improving, improvements in access in a very good of the resource of the supplies and resources, but also in the cost of accessing healthcare. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, so it sounds like things have stabilized a bit. Of course, we still have a lot of issues. And I think for We Care Solar, um, an organization that focuses on the intersection of renewable energy and maternal health, this is something that we've thought a lot about. I know a lot of NGOs, um, development agencies around the world are really figuring out how to adapt to the COVID. 19 pandemic so that we can continue our critical work. Um, and it's the same for We Care Solar. So we are in various phases in our Light Every Birth implementation. Um, fortunately, in Liberia, we've accomplished our goal. So every public health facility across the country has access to reliable light and electricity. Uh, Uganda and Zimbabwe were well underway. We've, we're doing hundreds of installations each year. And then Sierra Leone is our newest country. They signed on just this year. So, we're at very dis different phases, but of course, um, COVID-19 has impacted all of our programs in all of our countries. Um, Feza, you spoke earlier about lockdowns just generally across Uganda. I know that we were in the middle of installations when the lockdown was implemented. Um, how did that affect our installations and how did we have to adapt? Um, thank you, Christina. So um, during the lockdown, as I had mentioned, um, transportation, non essential work was at a standstill. So installations had to halt until we got approval from government to continue the installations. Thankfully, Ministry of Health granted us this approval almost immediately and installations continued. However, installers have had challenges in the field that include 
difficulty in finding affordable accommodation uh, because the motels, as I had mentioned before, were closed initially. They're only opening up now. Um, so the accommodation was relatively expensive for that that they could find. And then the cost of PPEs like sanitizers, masks were also relatively high given the demand at that time. All this resulted into um, higher operating costs for the installers. Also, our installers have had to adjust to the new normal. And I mean to operate and adapt to the new normal and ensure that they observe the government and we care solar SOPs to prevent the spread of COVID-19. These include wearing PPEs during installations and training of the health workers, ensuring social distancing during training. So some of the health facilities are actually small. So to ensure social distancing, they have to train from outdoors. So these are some of the challenges and um, the new, the adjustments that the installers had to make in Uganda. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, and I know that we had to work really heavily with government to make sure that we had the paperwork to be able to move, so we're really grateful for our partnership for the Ministry of Health. Um, Shamiza, we were also installing in Zimbabwe during lockdown. I know we had our own experience there, um, but we've, we've added this year, we're piloting at We Care Solar, adding a no-touch infrared thermometer. Um, so can you speak a bit about, um, you know, why did we include thermometers and how are they being used? Thank you so much, Christina. Um, so we included uh, thermometers in order to further support the government's response uh, to COVID-19 um, in, the, in their public health facilities. And um, the inclusion of the thermometer uh, is part of the solar suitcase that we're installing. Uh, and this uh, is to benefit uh, mothers who come for antenatal care visits or those who come um, in labor for delivery, uh, as well as to benefit any patient who comes to the facility who needs to be screened for COVID-19. So ideally, when we share um, the thermometers with the health facilities, um, we encourage as much as possible, though they have the overall uh, discretion in terms of uh, where to use the thermometers, uh, but we were encouraging them to use them at the entrance of the health facility uh, to ensure that everyone who's entering the health facility is screened. Um, we encourage use at the outpatient department, which is a triage area. Um, again, to ensure that all patients, including pregnant women, are screened. Um, and we also encourage uh, the use of the thermometers in the labor and delivery rooms. Um, so yeah, uh, so so far, uh, apart from uh, the thermometers that are going to be installed at the health facilities, we've handed over uh, some thermometers directly to uh, the Minister of Health uh, so that they're able to uh, utilize them in, in some of the gaps that they have at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to share my screen real quick to show some um, of the photos to illustrate what both Feza and Fatmata are speaking about. Um, I hope everyone can see my screen. If not, let me know. Um, but this is, um, uh, I think Fiona's on our call, Fiona abajo Bruce. She's our Uganda program assistant. Um, here she is with a thermometer, as you can see, teaching health workers how to use it. Again, it's a non-contact thermometer and actually it uses rechargeable batteries that the solar suitcase um, charges. And here you can see a health worker screening a patient as they come into the facility. Um, as Feza mentioned, we've had to kind of adapt how we do trainings of health workers. Um, usually we wanna get as many people as we can and it's in kind of a, a crowded room. Um, when possible, we try to do it outside, as you can see here of our installers in Uganda and Zimbabwe. Um, and then, you know, as well, trying to social distance when we, when we can. Um, again, our our installers have had to kind of adhere to some precautions, making sure that they have access to PPE. Um, here's an installer from Zimbabwe. Um, these are installers in Uganda. And as you can see, making sure that they also are practicing hygiene and sanitation. And then as Ambrose kind of uh, talked a bit about, of course, maternal and newborn care is affected. Um, we shared before with our research a webinar and other ways, um, the impact of what it's like to work in the dark for both uh, the health worker and the mother. If you can imagine what it must be like for the photo on the left in the dark to be able to also do this during the pandemic. It's just a really frightful time for everyone. 
Um, health facilities are doing what they can to improve hygiene as well. Um, patients having access to PPE. Um, but I want to be really clear here as a health worker with gloves, masks, um, to, be, to be honest, you know, when we go to these facilities, our installers will note that not all the health workers, one, have access to it, or two, want to wear PPE. Um, so this isn't necessarily reflective of what we're seeing at the rural facilities. Uh, so that's a bit about um, our installation in terms of our work in, in Uganda and Zimbabwe. Sierra Leone, we're in a very different phase. We just signed a tri-party agreement with the Ministry of Health and Energy this year, and we had ambitious plans to do a launch with um, a highly attended launch with the government, as well as uh, training of installers to make sure that we have teams that can train or that can do installations. Fatmata, can you talk a bit about some of the delays we've had in Sierra Leone and how we're trying to adapt to them? Sure, thank you, Christina. Indeed, it has been challenging, but the good thing is with our work with BKS Solar, using virtual platforms like Zoom, Skype, and so on, it's common for us because we have staff all over. But still, initially, it took us by surprise, and um, it did affect a lot of things in Sierra Leone. For example, um, delays in shipment for months, um, and this has slowed down implementation. But we are currently using a virtual platform whereby we can track remotely our shipments. So the good news is, despite all the delays, we are expecting two shipments of solo suitcases in December and January. Additionally, our partners are still very much committed to light every birth, and we have the full support of the government. Um, in terms of training, uh, the training of, of our installers has been delayed, and so installations have also been delayed because we are limited in-person trainings. But again, we found a way around this. We are working with um, a, a company um, that will do remote training for our technicians in January. Um, another thing was we're hoping that we would have launched the Light Every Birth initiative by now. But again, because we are trying to avoid large gatherings, we have put a hold on this, but we are now working to do a hybrid launch, which would be composed of um, some in-person attendance, as well as to launch through Zoom or Facebook Live, something very much like this webinar we're having right now. And then again, hosting meetings, going to meetings. Um, sometimes some of those meetings you have to have face-to-face. -face. It's better if you have a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting, but again, with COVID, you try to limit the in-person meetings. So now it's using more WhatsApp, phone calls, text messages, Zoom. Um, in fact, we had our first steering committee meeting for Light Every Birth in Sierra Leone last week. It was well attended and it was a very productive um, meeting. So we are finding ways to adjust um, to this new reality um, to ensure that our work continues while still looking for a, sustainable, a more sustainable um, ways to do so. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Yeah, we're all learning different ways to, to do virtual meetings and, and events. And um, just for Fatma to mention that we're working with that group on the remote training. Um, the, the group is called Remote Energy. And those that joined us for the Power of Women, Tara Weiss is actually one of the founders and she's um, helping to really lead that, that um, remote curriculum that we're going to implement. Um, turning to Liberia, Miyatose, I feel so fortunate that um, we have installed and reached our goals across Liberia prior to COVID-19, but um, we're really working with the government right now on a sustainability plan. Um, what are some of the things that we've had to put on hold in Liberia and how are we adapting to that? Yeah, thank you again, Christina. Um, as first, our sustainability our plan and exit strategy delay because of COVID-19. However, Behind the scene, we have been working with the government and uh, they have been cooperating. For instance, uh, the sustainability plan. Um, I just received a call today. Tomorrow, the final uh, signature will be uh, done. Uh, then we'll move forward with whatever we have planned for the uh, next quarter. For instance, the training, we have to hold on to the training until the materials come and we have the shipment that we're expecting in the country by the, the end of November. So, and uh, we are also working on the SMS, help decks, which we are still working with. And uh, by January, we hope to kick out the training of all the health uh, technicians to be able to carry out uh, 
the work while we live. So uh, just a, a few uh, activities were left behind because of COVID-19, but I think we are on par. We want to work and complete in time. It's just a delay. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to hear about uh, the work and how it, um, we've, we've adapted to continue that work. Um, so we're coming close to the top of the hour. Um, we've heard in this uh, webinar, we know very well from our pretty revealed for many of us around the world, gaps in care, um, really strong inequities and insufficient resources. And we've seen how important public health units are, how important it is to strengthen our health facilities in response to the pandemic. Of course, at We Care Solar, we're really interested about this work and thinking about ways that we can, in particular, play for prevention and management of COVID-19. So I want to end asking Feza and Shimizo, you know, you've seen what, um, the impact of what it's been like for us in terms of installations during the pandemic. Feza, can you start us off? What have you seen or heard in terms of how renewable energy or the solar suitcases have played in terms of the impact it's had on prevention and management of COVID-19 at the facilities? Um, thank you, Christina. So as we all know that the ability for health workers to effectively and promptly screen and treat infected patients requires fully functioning health facilities with not only medical equipment, but also access to reliable electricity. So having reliable electricity 24 hours is very vital amidst this pandemic. So one needs to see well to treat well. And given the low level of reliable electricity access in Uganda, especially in rural areas, renewable energy has become very important to ensure proper screening, identification, sample collection, packaging, and action. So we've seen the solar suitcase very important in our country. Thank you, Feza. Shimiza, what would you like to add? Uh, thanks, Christina and Feza. Um, you find that in Zimbabwe, our um, primary healthcare centers um, are mainly within the communities, the wards, and um, above them, they are district hospitals. Um, and um, if, a, if, a, if a primary health center uh, gets an emergency case, uh, the responsibility is on the health worker to communicate to the district hospital so that an ambulance is sent uh, to come and collect that um, patient. And you'll find that um, some of the health workers have really appreciated the solar suitcase uh, in the sense that they've been able to keep their mobile phones uh, charged up. And uh, in cases of emergencies, they've been able to communicate uh, with the district hospitals uh, timely uh, to intervene and save uh, patients. And um, in terms of uh, the deliveries that occur at night, uh, some of the health workers, again, have um, attested to work being made much easier uh, in terms of them being able to see clearly uh, all the procedures that happen at night. Uh, you know, the solar suitcase has the headlamps um, and those that have mentioned that they're able to uh, conduct their suturing uh, much well as it focuses light on the necessary areas that they'll be working on. So the, the, the health workers have really appreciated uh, the solar suitcase. Thank you very much, Feza and Shimizo. Um, we're just at the top of the hour. Um, I want to open up to any of the panelists if there's anything that we haven't covered that you would like the audience to know or share um, before we um, open up to questions and comments from the audience. Thank you, Christina, and uh, thank you, everybody, for being part of this uh, important discussion and connection, like the power of connection says. I just want to make a few remarks, I think, from my side. One thing is that humanity has been collectively faced with the most devastating challenge, I think, since World War II. So COVID-19 has proved that it knows no borders, it knows no country, it spares nobody and strikes every community without discriminating. But of course, with different magnitudes of, of consequences. So I've seen it affect the health sector in different ways. 
And from the discussion, we've realized that from the health sector, the economy, the social lives of the people, it has been able to affect them. I would want to draw attention to the, its effect on women, children, and newborns who are the foundation of societies and because of their vulnerability. So I will call upon all of us to be able to contribute in any way possible, whether individual at organizational level, to be able to strike and stop the spread of the pandemic, but also to be aware that no one is safe until everybody is safe. So we are not safe at all, whether you hide in your home, whether you hide where, all of us will only be safe when everybody else is safe. So let's work together and put all our efforts together in addressing the challenges of the pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambrose. I think those are really wise and thoughtful words to end on. I know it's um, at the hour, so if anyone needs to leave, um, feel free to. We will have a recording of this on our website along with the slides. Um, but we are gonna open it up to comments and questions at this time. And I think we've had a few um, questions. So let's see. So we hear from Lindsay Maida. She's asked, um, has COVID-19 created noticeable distrust between the healthcare workers and community members due to this strikes? Fatmanta, can you speak a little bit about your experience and what you've seen in terms of the trust um, when the health workers are striking in Sierra Leone? Thank you, Christina. And thank you, Lindsay, for that question. Well, the good thing is we're seeing that um, people are going back to the health facilities now. So it's almost at pre-COVID times, people are still using health facilities. And no, I don't, I, in my experience, I don't think there's been any distress between community members and health workers because health worker, um, community members understand that health workers, mothers, their fathers, their sisters, their brothers, they have um, their concerns are valid. And so there is there's support for the health workers. So during my time here, I've realized that um, there's been a lot of support for health workers. So there hasn't been any um, distrust. And again, we're seeing that more and more people are frequenting health facilities. Thank you. Thank you. Me, Tosi, is there anything you wanna add? I know that right now Liberia is currently having strikes with health workers. What would you like to add to that? And we'll just make sure you're on unmuted. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah, yeah Liberia, we have uh, the health workers on strike now uh, because of uh, has a pay. They work through uh, COVID, through the COVID, so they should be paid, and uh, they are not being paid. So uh, the government is taking different steps. So up to this time, they are still on strike. Um, just to also add on what Fermata said, uh, we had a mistrust uh, here with the, the patients and the, the health workers. Uh, people, people fear that uh, the health worker might infect them if they have to go to the hospital. So this is a mistrust. Yeah, they don't trust them and sometimes when they go to the hospital, they feel that every test done might come out positive for COVID. So you see that uh, most people lose their trust, lost their trust in the health workers. So we still have that trust here today, although it's a little bit uh, diminishing, but uh, that is the mistrust still going on. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think as we heard from, thank you, we heard from Ambrose too, I think things are changing over time as, as yeah. people are becoming more familiar with COVID and the information, yeah. like, um, we might see something different a little bit, but thank you for sharing. We have one other question. Um, let me pull it up for a second. Um, from Harley Feiger. Um, this is an interesting question. Uh, which African country has been the most successful in keeping the COVID-19 at bay and why? It's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know if I could speak specifically, but I think we know very well that um, government early intervention was really critical. So making sure that movement in and out of the country um, was restricted, making sure that implementation of masks and social distancing was really important. But Ambrose, I know you're very well informed of kind of the interventions that are happening 
Do you have a reflection on which countries in Africa you think have done better and what are some of those reasons why? Thank you, Christina. The question is very interesting, like you've mentioned. It's very, very interesting. First of all, I would want to put a disclaimer that you would want to gauge a country by its location and the surrounding environments and circumstances. And also, we are aware that all countries, despite of whatever resources were available, most of the responses were important for the delay in transmission and the preparation of the health sector so that they are able to respond once cases go up. I would say in Uganda specifically, we had a, a good run for, the, for a good leadership. The point that we got our first case of COVID-19 after about, it's about uh, towards the end of March, and we stayed in one to three cases for close to three months. And you can realize even after close to 10 months of COVID-19 in Uganda, we have, 10, we have 95 reported deaths, which is quite a substantial uh, response in my, in my opinion. So it depends on which country and what circumstances you're looking up to. But for them, uh, to respond to the question specifically, I think different countries showed quite a very good approaches depending on the leadership perspective, because that was very critical mm -hmm. in ensuring that you give a very, you give a very clear guidance. In Uganda, we had, a, we had a, an, a, an almost clear strike of our motorcyclists who are complaining to government that they want to work and they want to get money. And the president said, look here, if airports are closed and air aircrafts are on ground, so what do you mean by your simple system being on the road to look for money? So he was emphasizing the fact that this is a common good. It's not about one individual or a group of people. So to me, I wouldn't specifically say there has, is a good country or a bad country, but it has been dependent on one, leadership, and two, coordination and uh, mobilization of resources to be able to respond appropriately. But, uh, but for Uganda specifically, I'd say we've done quite a substantial job and we are still seeing quite very good improvements in response and appropriation of resources to turn around the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say specifically country. I don't know, Christina, you might have a better response. I think it, I think that's a, a really good response and understanding what are the, some of the things from your perspective and what we've seen as well that makes a response more successful. Um, so I just want to open it up. We have just a few minutes left that will be on. And please uh, feel free to share any last questions that you have um, before we end. I guess I want to ask the panelists one last question that maybe we all are thinking as well when we think about government response. Um, we heard, you know, the very dire situation in terms of the economic burden and just gaps um, in care and gaps in society. Um, so I want to open up to the panelists, but, you know, what additional responses to COVID-19 could be done to address these economic burdens and additional gaps that we, we heard about throughout this? Um, Feza, um, could you tell us what you think maybe in terms of what you've seen or what some of the suggestions that you have? Um, thank you, Christina. Uh, having an economic background um, is something that I've been thinking about uh, um, with all the discussions that have been going on in country about what the government should do. Well, um, the president came up and actually uh, wanted the landlords to, to give some kind of holiday to the tenants during this time. So, but then I'm thinking that the landlords also are paying loans to banks and at the same time need to also um, have empathy for the, for the tenants. But then I think what government would do would actually go in to the banks and then um, request the banks to probably give, um, could I say loan holidays to the, to the, to the, to the, um, the ones who have like the, the loans with the bank or give them some time to pay back or anything so that the landlords can actually be able to do what the government is asking them to do, to be able to give the tenants holiday. But then also the government can step in. Mostly we've seen, I, I explained how the kids have been closed and the malls have been closed. 
maybe the government can go in and and, and buy these malls mm -hmm. <laughs> so that they can be able to be um, government property so that instead of asking that the landlords to be able to give these tenants holidays now the government will be the one to give these tenants holidays because they bought the, the, the properties from the landlords. I think that's something that the government can do to step in. I would say they would also give the, 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 um, the people money, but you know money, giving someone money today, what does that mean? How will it help? Maybe they can invest in things that, um, projects that people can get jobs in because people have really lost jobs in Uganda. Yeah. So I think those are some of the things that government can, can help um, with the people in our country. I think it was a really interesting insights and I, I would agree that even those recommendations would be great for even where I live at one of the most expensive places in the world really giving people some economic relief um, because we know that this pandemic there's already huge inequity um, and, and this is just exasperating it. Uh, Shamiza would you like to add anything in terms of your perspective of, of what else government could be doing? Thank you Christina. Uh, certainly um, it's uh, availing resources, additional resources, um, especially for the transport sector, the public transport sector. You know, with the easing of lockdown restrictions, uh, more people have been going back to their places of work. Uh, there's more usage of uh, uh, public transport. And with issues of social distancing, um, that is meant to sort of um, minimize close contact. Um, that has not really been uh, very successful in, in, in some of the instances I've observed. I've observed people uh, standing in queues waiting to, 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 to board the transport, whether to work or back home, uh, in very close uh, to each other. Um, attribute this to uh, lack of adequate transport to meet the, the social distancing needs, because um, mm -hmm. ideally the public transporters should um, load at maybe 70% capacity, but they're loading at, as usual, 100% capacity. Uh, so if the government could come in and sort of assist this sector, they would be able to adhere to some of these um, restrictions and it would help uh, minimize the spread of uh, COVID, especially when it's related to the traffic sector. Well, thank, thank you. Um, so uh, we are coming to the close of the webinar. Um, if, if there are any other questions, please feel free to share them, but um, we are gonna wrap up soon. I really wanna thank our panelists for sharing their experiences. I mean, COVID-19 has impacted all of us and to hear from your opinions and your experiences has just been really insightful. Um, and I wanna thank everyone who joined us for this discussion. Um, thank you so much. Again, a recording will be available online on our website. And for our next event in our 10 by 10 series, next week, please join us for our light out challenge where we care solar staff and friends are gonna turn off the lights and experience a night without power. So stay tuned for more details. Thank you again to all of our panelists, all of our audience members, for everyone who joined us today. And we wish you a good rest of the day and evening. Thank you.